Okay, uh, welcome back to the information visualization lecture. Today we're going to develop the vocabulary to talk about visualization, to analyze existing ones and also to start conceptualizing new information visualizations. Last week we looked at the definition and purpose of information visualization. As a teaser I have briefly shown you some experimental projects from our own research. Today we're going to slow down the pace and we'll cover some history and uh, the basic components of any information visualization. Okay, so let's dive right into it. Um, so let's start with a bit of history. So actually um, graphical uh, capabilities have come a long way over um, yeah, the span of uh, humankind to um, uh, look at it uh, uh, from a kind of larger perspective. So um, actually uh, static images uh, have been found uh, in caves uh, um, in, in Spain um, and they originate uh, um, um, from a time over 64,000 years ago and um, these, yeah, these, these uh, images, these drawings um, contain uh, uh, um, paintings of uh, groups of animals. Uh, there are some actually uh, geometric symbols and signs uh, included, uh, as well as uh, hand stencils, which I think are probably something that really pop out in, in this image here. Uh, hand stencils and prints and some engravings. Now, um, um, going doing a fast forward uh, to 4,000 years ago, um, actually, um, on an, um, uh, in a tomb, uh, um, in an Egyptian tomb, um, there's actually a, a wrestling scene uh, on a wall. Um, and arguably, if you take a close look at this, this could be considered uh, a, mo a moving image uh, or an animated image, a series of uh, kind of um, yeah, uh, moves in a, in a wrestling uh, scene or fight. Um, and then if you uh, uh, go even more uh, uh, closer to, to the present, we have uh, interactive and dynamic graphics. Um, over 40, even 50 years ago now, um, here uh, is a still from uh, what has become known as uh, the mother of all demos. Uh, so you see in that uh, um, very early a, a, a very early instance of interactive manipulation of data and graphics. Now, um, actually, um, the um, kind of major milestones of visualization history, basically a subset of what we just looked at, uh, maybe reaches back to um, um, yeah over the last 500 years or so. Uh, here's an attempt to trace the history of visualization. Um, the line, um, the curve, um, is a rough attempt to quantify uh, visualization breakthroughs um, while the earliest visualizations were about um, yeah, exploration and discovery. Later, around in the 18th century, we actually see quite a bit of uh, charts on economics. Um, arguably as a tool of colonialism and uh, the rise of capitalism. And in 19th century, um, we also see um, several um, yeah, visualization uh, innovations uh, around the topic of public health, which uh, of course has become a very current topic over the last few um, weeks and months. Now, um, let's take a, a closer look at some of these breakthroughs. So actually here's a slightly older example. Uh, this is a, a very early visualization. Um, um, actually, one, uh, most of the earliest uh, visualizations were actually about movements of stars, such as this one here. Um, and uh, so we see here planetary movements over the course of um, uh, several uh, hours over the night. Um, and um, um, it's important to know that apart from actually uh, recording kind of what's going on in the sky, uh, um, um, these, uh, um, yeah, these visualizations were also used as navigation aids uh, to actually support um, seafaring and kind of uh, movement uh, in, in space. So it's not just uh, um, um, only or primarily an attempt to understand what's happening in, 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 in the sky. Another example of uh, uh, 
uh, of this outlook towards the sky is uh, this um, um, yeah both recording and also the diagram of sunspots um, in 1611 uh, what is interesting here that is that we see basically uh, a small multiple arrangement um, so that's actually a technique that is still used where you basically arrange maybe in a tabular grid such as here such as done here um, um, multiple smaller charts or smaller visual representations which in this orderly uh, layout lets you compare between these spots. Then we have um, what is considered the first timeline visualization uh, that uses bars to indicate the duration, so horizontal bars here, the duration of life spans. Uh, so, so Joseph Priestley um, has uh, created this to um, actually allow us to compare uh, and see the uh, contemporaries uh, in politics and um, let's say science. So on the right you see the label statesman and men of learning. So uh, you see um, who has lived roughly around the same time. What is really cool about this chart is that Priestley has already accounted for uncertainty. So uh, wherever um, the birth or um, death years were not known, um, he actually um, marked um, these uncertainties with uh, dots. Another chart by uh, Joseph Priestley. Um, here we have the new chart of history where basically the horizontal axis is a time uh, and vertical is kind of like a geographic categorization um, where um, um, yeah, different um, nations, empires, countries are uh, um, clustered together and separated again depending on their kind of um, integrity um, and um, Priestley uh, um, basically created this uh, to as, as, a, as a teaching uh, aid, a, a support in um, uh, seeing, helping students to see the, um, the rise, the growth, the also the decline of states and nations uh, over a considerable time span here. But it's important to note that, of course, uh, these charts were not meant to um, um, replace textual description of history, but rather were meant as a, a kind of overview, a kind of um, uh, synoptic perspective on, on history. Um, yeah, um, another actually also Time, uh, time visualization is here by William Playfair, uh, who mapped um, the um, exports and imports between um, um, what was basically I don't know the UK I guess or the I guess England um, and uh, Denmark and Norway and um, not UK just England. And uh, what is interesting is that uh, it's really just two lines. Uh, so you see uh, the yellow line is basically the imports, so the goods coming from Denmark and Norway, and the red line, the exports going there from England. And uh, the area in between those lines um, indicates a deficit um, um, before, I don't know, around 1754 or so. Um, and then actually a surplus afterwards when there are more exports. Uh, so the balance is actually in favor of England. And he also notes this down. So um, that's, uh, I think, a, quite a effective chart to, to look at this uh, trade relationship between these two um, countries and how this has changed over the years. Now, more current than ever, um, here we have um, the famous cholera map. Uh, of central London by John Snow, which helped or which is known to uh, help identify the source of the outbreak. Um, it's kind of disputed whether actually the, the map itself uh, uh, was um, identifying the source or just helped to convey that knowledge about it. Nevertheless, uh, um, we basically see here uh, these. Um, um, yeah, these bar charts, uh, which are basically the cholera cases and uh, how they're clustered around a very specific pump. Uh, another example, uh, actually from the health domain, is Florence Nightingale's um, diagram of the causes of mortality in the army in the East. Um, and this, um, yeah, this uh, uh, diagram, which has 
is, is now known as the Rose Diagram, uh, basically demonstrates um, the impact of epidemic diseases um, that uh, uh, actually caused more deaths uh, in these uh, British uh, hospitals during the Crimean War uh, than, um, 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 let's say, let's call them genuine uh, battlefield wounds. So um, uh, Nightingale actually included this chart or this graph um, as part of a report in which she argued for a variety of improvements to care facilities, including the provision of nutrition, better nutrition, ventilation and shelter. Um, and uh, so we, we see an example of, uh, of a, um, yeah, a, a visualization at, the, at this um, interface between um, uh, science and, and policy, actually. Um, here, a, a more maybe lighthearted uh, um, um, visualization by Minar, uh, a map of French wine exports. Uh, so the thickness of uh, these bands uh, laid across um, a, a world map that is slightly distorted, actually. So you actually see in the north of France, uh, the ports, uh, as well as uh, Netherlands uh, and, and Belgium, they are uh, uh, actually appearing a bit bigger to make space for, and, and also uh, England is a bit uh, further away to make space for, for, for these um, bands. Um, and it also uh, actually in the, um, uh, in the top right uh, corner, you see actually a temporal um, um, development of uh, wine export. So um, I guess that's a pretty clear uh, indication that uh, v um, these kinds of visualizations um, um, were also used to convey um, yeah, trade relationships, in this case, uh, French wine. Um, actually, a similar but much more uh, intricate um, uh, example, and also probably um, one of the classic um, uh, examples of um, data visualization history is Napoleon's March by uh, Mina, um, which um, yeah, um, actually contains uh, several um, visual variables used to encode the decreasing size of the army, the location, um, you know, there are several rivers actually marked, um, the, uh, the weather uh, actually on, during the retreats so on the bottom of the chart you see actually the declining temperatures uh, during the winter um, and uh, in the end uh, this is of course also comp uh, accompanied with uh, a description and it's it's yeah it's considered a hallmark uh, example of, of data visualization especially because it integrates uh, a range of uh, dimensions um, here we have a visualization uh, by Meret uh, who mapped um, yeah, the speed of, of trains between Paris and Lyon um, and um, the speed is basically uh, encoded uh, in the slope of these lines. So um, um, on the horizontal axis you have the hours and the day, vertically you have the different train stops and um, the brief interruptions of these lines are basically the time, the minutes, or sometimes it's uh, half an hour or an entire hour, uh, um, the, 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 the temporal length when uh, the trains are stopping in stations. And uh, um, this technique is actually still being used, uh, it's still at least it's still circulating in the analysis of um, train networks and um, uh, arrival, departure and travel times. Um, to see basically how um, trains are um, um, kind of how train connections are basically distributed uh, over the course of a day um, and see how they are um, uh, um, lined up with different stops. Murray was uh, quite interested actually in, in movement. He also did uh, some experiments with uh, um, uh, observing actually uh, how people move when they're running or walking as well as animals. He did this also with, uh, with horses um, and with that he actually invent, invented time series images um, by uh, doing uh, um, kind of the, uh, um, a superimposition uh, of multiple um, uh, photographs uh, taken in a, in a series uh, using also this uh, white tape attached to, to the person. Uh, Charles Booth um, 
created this map uh, of London in which um, the living and working conditions of uh, Londoners were mapped. So you see a, a legend on the bottom right um, which um, yeah, describes in partially problematic terms different classes and uh, you basically see the poorer uh, more struggling uh, uh, segments of the society in these uh, tones, shades of blue um, and the uh, better off, the more affluent uh, uh, parts of society in, in red and, um, and yellow. And by you know, scanning kind of uh, the distribution of these two tones, these two color tones, uh, you can see the, how um, at the time um, poorer people would live more crowded in these um, backyards of buildings and these smaller crowded streets while the rich would live uh, uh, in uh, possibly larger apartments towards the, uh, the, the squares and larger streets with m more access to uh, fresh air and uh, basically uh, uh, taking the, um, um, yeah, the, um, having access to better living conditions. Uh, and he uh, actually gathered a lot of this data himself and used this um, map um, as a um, yeah in support of his uh, philan philanthropist uh, work. So he was actually uh, fighting for uh, um, more support and help um, um, of the um, yeah poorer classes of London. Um, another uh, uh, slightly later example of data visualization history is this cover of an exhibition catalog um, which um, yeah, visualizes a range of art movements before and after cu cubism. Um, it uh, was the, on the cover of this exhibition catalog and uh, it's a mixture basically of a directed network diagram uh, blended with actually uh, a timeline, so the vertical axis is actually a timeline um, and it um, uh, basically promises some kind of uh, overview over um, the main art schools and art movements. It's actually somewhat controversial now because there's some uh, actually art schools uh, missing uh, and uh, kind of presents uh, 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 modern art as uh, uh, something clean and complete uh, even though certain influences especially uh, also from non-western uh, parts of the world uh, are uh, neglected here. But it's still quite quite a classic representation. Um, isotype uh, is uh, a visualization or let's say a visual language to uh, communicate social structures and transformations in society. This was uh, invented by Otto and Marie Neurath and Gerd Arns uh, in the Social and Economic Museum in Vienna um, with the intention to, have, to create uh, accessible, easy to read, easy to interpret um, diagram so that uh, citizens can inform themselves about uh, society and what's going on around them, what kind of changes are underfoot uh, and the kind of um, 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 typical representation of isotype are these figurines or these symbols that uh, have a certain figurative um, quality to them. So you actually not just see abstract bar charts here when it's uh, when you're looking at the uh, kind of um, social structure uh, of v Vienna, but um, there are actually yeah uh, little little symbols, little pictograms that uh, represent different uh, you know workers, um, um, office workers, uh, um, house uh, personnel, and so forth. <clears throat> so, but I wanted to include this here because it's actually quite an important. Um, um, let's say predecessor to modern data visualization also because it had that uh, um, impetus and this motivation to inform and help uh, um, uh, citizens make um, possibly the right decisions, whatever the right decisions are, but um, to get engaged politically uh, uh, based on, on the knowledge gained through the use of such, um, uh, such diagrams. Now um, so that uh, was a quick rundown. So we started with uh, planetary movements, uh, uh, communicating temporal patterns among biographies and nations, economic developments. Um, then 
uh, later we have seen uh, a few uh, visualizations on public health, global economy, conflicts and battles, uh, and then more recently also um, charts and visualizations on transportation, poverty and inequality, uh, new uh, recording and animation technologies, and art and social change now, at, at the last one we just looked at. So information visualization has come a long way, uh, technically, aesthetically, and in a way also functionally. So um, it has been already in use in quite a few uh, sectors. Uh, and now we are fast forwarding into uh, um, contemporary information visualization practice, which uh, has resulted in a wide variety of techniques visualizing also a, a variety of uh, data structures such as uh, temporal data um, so that we have time series visualizations um, relational data so networks uh, but also hierarchical data so we have uh, kind of tree structures we talked about these different structures last week uh, with also multi-dimensional data so we have multiple columns or um, features uh, that we want to compare and uh, also spatial data uh, so data sets that contain uh, uh, geolocations or have a reference to uh, geospatial entities. Um, and this is not a uh, complete overview, but this is maybe can, we can consider these uh, kind of um, very typical um, data structures for which uh, visualization techniques have been developed. What's missing here, I must say, uh, actually text data. We will actually will look at uh, uh, visualizing text also in one of the upcoming lectures and also tutorial in one tutorial. Um, uh, and of course, there are other kinds of data structures and uh, um, data types uh, as well. Just to give you kind of a quick glimpse. Now. Um, when we look at uh, a, a given data visualization or when we want to create a data visualization, um, there are a few key concepts that help you contextualize the design and study of it. Um, and the first one is um, what is typically considered uh, uh, users. So for whom do we um, create data visualizations? What's the audience? Are these readers, viewers, users? Are they, uh, do they have a specific context? Uh, maybe certain previous knowledge, certain perceptual needs, um, particular interests. So um, this is something we should keep in mind uh, when we look at data visualizations. Then we have the tasks, the activities that uh, these users are engaging with uh, when they are um, looking at or using data visualizations. So um, and here we can ask, you know, what kind of requirements are there to uh, fulfill them, what, what are the success criteria, when, when is a task actually accomplished, does it actually make sense for a given scenario, what are particular challenges, and maybe also what are they doing at the very moment, uh, what are they using uh, maybe before using visualization, or are there already visualizations uh, uh, in use. And then uh, we have also the site, of course, uh, which is often considered the first step, um, is of course the data set uh, or the data sets, uh, um, and here, um, here we can ask what kind of structures are there, um, what are the attributes, and also how, to which degree is the data available. Uh, um, are there maybe missing data elements? Is the data still being collected? Uh, under which circumstances? So this is something um, that um, um, uh, actually really uh, makes a difference than uh, when we are dealing with individual data visualizations. Now, data, 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 um, what are we talking about um, when we're talking about data? Um, so um, here is a quick rundown uh, of um, uh, typical data types. Um, so typically, we uh, uh, categorize uh, data sets at the most basic level uh, along data types uh, into in the three very basic types. That's first nominal data, so we can distinguish uh, between um, uh, different entities because they are labeled or they are part of a specific category, so they're distinct. Um, data can be ordinal, uh, so it means that there's a certain order, it's in, it's in the name already, so there's a certain uh, um, um, sorting uh, between these different entities. Data can also be qu quantitative, uh, we assume it's always the case, it doesn't have to be, but um, here, um, for example, the the distance between A and B is twice as long as the distance between 
B and C. So these are um, the most basic um, uh, data types, nominal, ordinal and quantitative, and they will pop up again in the tutorials and in, in any uh, uh, discussion that we have when we look at data visualizations, we need to be aware of the data types. And then there are some additional more, let's say, complex data types. Uh, here we have, um, so data can be relational, uh, so it can be a network, so in this case B is connected to both A and C, and A and C are also connected to each other via B, so indirectly. And we can consider this here as well as a, as a hierarchical data set in which B is the root node. Um, and, <clears throat> and A has uh, two children and C is uh, a leaf node. Data sets can also contain temporal um, um, uh, aspects. So um, if we consider these three little example entities here as events, we might uh, consider uh, or can observe that um, B happened right after A and then after a longer time uh, actually C happened. So um, temporal, um, the temporal dimension um, um, provides uh, a way of contextualizing um, elements. And then Last but not least, and often actually uh, quite interesting also in combination with the other data types, um, we can have spatial data. So in this case here, B is located closer to C, um, but uh, there is a water body uh, between them. Okay, so, um, and what I wanted to uh, add here uh, um, is that uh, especially in combination uh, such as uh, uh, time and, and or temporal data and spatial data, we can actually infer and pull in quite a lot of additional context, uh, whether it's historical data or um, um, you know weather information or whatever. Uh, so with, with time and, and place, um, um, we, we, we are able to also integrate uh, multiple data sets uh, uh, through these shared characteristics. Now, um, data can come in all kinds of structures. The most common uh, structure that we are facing is probably a tabular structure or a table structure in which um, the rows are the items such as a person or a book uh, and the uh, attributes are um, uh, a given uh, aspect or uh, characteristic of uh, uh, the items uh, so um, um, such as age or, um, or, or name or whatever um, and then in this table, a particular value uh, or a cell basically is um, the uh, manifestation or the uh, specific uh, characterization of an attribute for an item. So for example, the age of someone could be 32. Um, uh, so this is something that um, you are uh, familiar with, but it's good to, to uh, kind of uh, think about data uh, as often coming actually in this, in this shape. Um, the, uh, here's a quick example um, of a philosopher data, data set in which uh, actually the ID column uh, is ordinal. It's, you know, um, it has a, has a very actually specific order here. The um, column's name and interests uh, are nominal, uh, of nominal data type, and uh, the birth year um, is, uh, well, on, on the very um, basic level uh, a quantitative um, column but of course we also talked about uh, kind of additional maybe slightly more complex data types uh, and of course the birth year is a uh, temporal um, um, dimension and birthplace on the one hand it might just be nominal we just treat it, treat it as a string the different uh, cities but um, on a higher level this is also a spatial uh, um, uh, dimension um, um, so we can actually uh, could also translate or transfer this into uh, GPS coordinates. Okay so this is this was just a quick rundown of um, the main uh, types of data that we're encountering. Um, um, there's of course more to be set and probably more to be considered uh, uh, in in when we're actually dealing with specific uh, actual data sets, but just for a start. Um, now let's think about uh, the essential components of, of information visualization. And um, 
this uh, is kind of an attempt here to start simple. So I would say the uh, fundamental components, uh, maybe ingredients for uh, information visualization are representation and interaction. On the representation side, uh, we are basically uh, asking ourselves how we can turn uh, data attributes uh, into visual qualities. And for that, the visual variables um, are basic, the basic vocabulary for doing this. So um, um, the first one being position, uh, so the x and y location on the plane, probably the most, um, the most powerful, the most precise uh, um, visual variable because we can actually see very small um, distinctions. Uh, so we can actually see when, a, when an object is slightly moved to the left or right, we can actually observe that. So there's a high resolution in our perception. Uh, and then there's size, that means could mean the length and or area of an item of a visual element, um, um, the brightness of it, the, the texture that is being used. So here we have a, some patterns, but there are of course other patterns possible. The color, color here is, uh, um, is now, th this is actually a, a slightly dated, but kind of the classic set of visual variables by Jacques Berton. Uh, color here means in this case hue and saturation, but typically it's also in combination with brightness. So color and value, you have to think, we have to think together. Uh, orientation, so uh, kind of the alignment or maybe the rotation of elements, uh, the different shapes, and uh, what is of course at, uh, um, unique and uh, maybe particularly promising in the digital context is the ability to change any of these visual variables and animate them. So for example, by changing the position, we can actually induce movement um, by, uh, I don't know, changing the brightness, um, we can actually make it kind of glow or pul pulsate a bit. So um, this is um, the, uh, so this set, uh, the, the static visual variables in, in written black and then animation here, this is, uh, these are our bu basic building blocks that we uh, can draw from, that we can consider when we're turning uh, data into visual form. So typically, uh, um, you know, uh, just to kind of illustrate this, you know, we might uh, uh, map higher numbers to larger uh, objects or, um, and we will see techniques, and you have seen already some techniques where this is being applied. But it's good to um, um, yeah, um, realize this, that uh, there is actually a limited number of visual variables that we can perceive and even for some of them uh, uh, we might even have difficulties so for example for color we should be aware that there are um, color perception deficiencies uh, um, actually in, uh, uh, um, in in the population we'll get to that when we talk about perception and uh, um, um, as, I, as I already alluded to some of these visual variables are um, um, very accurate in, in, uh, in, in that we can distinguish actually uh, small differences while others are less accurate but might still be um, 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 particularly useful to um, uh, convey um, categories or, um, uh, or different types. So here when we look at the, uh, the three basic uh, data types that I mentioned earlier uh, quantitative, ordinal, and nominal data. We see, for example, that color hue on the right. Uh, so position is on top everywhere because it's uh, basically the, what is considered to be uh, the, having the highest accuracy uh, across uh, all data types. But then some uh, um, visual variables uh, lend themselves uh, better to, to, uh, to uh, some, so some data types, which is indicated here uh, in this juxtaposition of these different uh, data types. So for example, color hue or texture uh, could also be used to uh, encode nominal data while uh, uh, the, um, uh, the length or the angle uh, is uh, more, um, more suitable for um, quantitative data. Okay, so this is uh, basically um, um, the building block for, for the representation bit. Now, when it comes to interaction, um, the basic tasks, overview, zoom, filter, and then details on demand, as outlined by Ben Schneiderman's uh, visual information seeking mantra, are uh, um, 
equally useful to think of um, to plan and design uh, the interaction uh, techniques, so the interactive capabilities of a visualization. Uh, Schneiderman also mentioned a few other tasks such as relate, history and extract, um, which are uh, also uh, I think useful for consideration. Um, especially extract, maybe we could call today maybe to share, uh, um, so we can actually maybe bring something uh, uh, into other contexts and maybe also share that with other people, with other with colleagues and, and the public. Um, and uh, but uh, especially the first four uh, tasks: overview, zoom, filter, details on demand. Uh, while Schneiderman prioritized them. Um, um, and that is something we could argue about whether really it needs to be overview first. There are cases where it doesn't really have to be the case, uh, where uh, we could also start with a particular document or particular element. Um, it's important to, I think, to consider uh, how uh, these different tasks should or could be supported in, a, in an information visualization. So it's in a way it, it gives you almost like a checklist uh, and you can think about how uh, um, yeah, viewers or users of the information visualization um, that you're um, that you're sharing or offering, how they could be, uh, you know, how, how they could uh, zoom into the data set or filter something that they're interested in or get more details and so forth. But of course, the um, the the uh, 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 the particular promise of information visualization is to provide an overview, to provide uh, a kind of a, some kind of summarization. Of a, of a data collection. Now, uh, so as I said, <clears throat> in a way, this is um, the, the visual variables and the basic tasks build um, the, uh, provide the building blocks or maybe a, a minimalist recipe for information visualization. So we can think of uh, how the visual encoding or the representation can be designed for a given, um, you know, data set, uh, uh, audience and and also kind of a scenario of, of tasks and the tasks the basic tasks as uh, outlined by uh, uh, Ben Schneiderman um, give us uh, a way to think of, think of and, and, and design interactive uh, capabilities um, another model another concept to think of um, visualization design development and also evaluation is the visualization pipeline uh, it provides a linear step-by-step uh, -step, uh, um, procedure on moving from raw data, that is the input, uh, that's being analyzed and pre into prepared data, maybe filtered on a subset that is um, relevant for a given task or project, then mapped to geometric forms, uh, rendered onto the screen, uh, and finally uh, uh, equipped with interaction. Um, it's a bit of a simplif simplified model, as every model is simplified. Um, um, but it also kind of uh, gives us a sense how um, um, actually the data uh, that we're working with needs to pass through uh, 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 several steps so that it can actually be uh, um, represented visually and also interacted with. Um, I don't think it's necessary that uh, we're... Um, um, sticking to these particular steps. Actually, I would simplify this a bit and open it up a bit uh, into ba uh, three basic steps. Um, so first, um, I think it's, first of all, it's about preparing the data set. So that means uh, picking, especially now uh, in, in, uh, in view of your data dossiers, um, actually picking a topic of your interest uh, and then for that, either producing your own data by, uh, you know, collecting it, uh, by actually generating data, uh, by observing something firsthand, or pursuing existing data sets, uh, actually, you know, identifying um, the institutions or individuals uh, who have collected a data set already. Uh, so uh, in this first step, it's really about getting the data uh, um, um, making it digitally available so that we can work with it. Uh, as a second step, or it could also be uh, um, actually several steps, so we could think of these also in, in three phases maybe, um, is uh, processing the data. So we need to slice and dice uh, the data for particular analyses. 
we might want to select particular attributes uh, uh, to do this, to, to do an analytical work with it. We might also bring other kinds of data sets to it that complement it. I mentioned earlier with regards to um, temporal and uh, spatial uh, data types. Um, uh, there might also be uh, identifiers that let us uh, integrate multiple data sets. That's, that's something that we could do at, in this stage when we're processing the data. We're also integrating possibly multiple sources. And uh, last but not least, uh, we want to turn uh, the data properties into visual and interactive features and arrangements. Uh, and for that, we want to basically present or represent uh, the data. Um, and for that, uh, we might uh, use existing visualization techniques or conceive maybe new encodings. Um, and this kind of three-step process is uh, something that you will uh, encounter again in the tutorials. So I will structure the, uh, the Jupyter notebooks along these three steps. Uh, so preparing the data, uh, which is basically pulling the data in and making it ready uh, uh, for processing, So then, which is then the next phase, processing it, slicing and dicing it, uh, and then presenting it, giving it a visual, uh, a visual manifestation. Um, these three steps uh, will also be the uh, uh, three steps of your next assignment uh, with which I close my lecture today. So um, until next week I'm asking you to create a visualization about something that you observe about yourself, your surroundings, your daily routine or something that you notice in the news um, uh, currently over the next um, yeah, week, next days. Um, and just as uh, we just talked about the, uh, the three steps, uh, you will also pursue these uh, three steps. You will uh, prepare the data, so that means you record your observations uh, as structured data, uh, and that could be of any data types that we talked about. Then you will, uh, I will invite you to process the data, so you basically examine it closely, uh, consider what kind of attributes you have actually uh, generated or brought there, and, uh, and then I'm asking you uh, to actually uh, draw or visualize the data. And I'm actually uh, totally happy if you, for now, just did this uh, on paper. It doesn't need to be on screen or with the software. It's really meant to be um, a finger exercise, a warm-up. Um, so use the visual variables um, that we uh, talked about in this lecture. Uh, do include a title and a legend, so we know what color or um, shapes actually mean. Um, and um, um, yeah, keep it keep it low tech. Uh, I would even suggest that you do it entirely on paper, uh, so that uh, you don't get uh, hung up with particular tools at this moment. We will have enough time the entire semester um, to fight with uh, Jupyter, Python, Pandas, Altair, and so forth. Uh, for this assignment, that's why it's also called Dear Data. If you want to get some inspiration, there's a wonderful project called Dear Data. Uh, um, Google it um, so you uh, um, see uh, in which direction I'm thinking here. So um, once you have then rendered or drawn uh, your visualization, uh, scan it or take a photo of it and post it uh, before the next session next week. Um, okay. Thank you for listening.